Setal calls Worf a Patak right after discussing the Romulan named Patak. Admiral Jarok likes his water at 12 Onkians, and there's a Klingon vessel named Bordas. Hello, everybody, and welcome <laughs> to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and today we are doing a review of Star Trek The Next Generation, Season 3, Episode 10, The Defector, written by Ronald D. Moore, directed by Robert Shearer. This was New Year's Day, January 1st, 1990. Where were you? What's up, Strock? How you doing today? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. How about you? Pretty good. Looking forward to March because everybody at home, you have got to go to Trek to San Francisco by yeah. Creation Entertainment, March 8th through 10th, but arrive on the 7th because we got some parties and stuff going there. Sorok's going to be there. I'm going to be there. Melissa Longo is going to be there. Over two dozen Star Trek and sci-fi celebrities are going to be there. It's in Burlingame, very, very close to the San Francisco airport. Uh, go to creationent.com. That's creationent.com for details and tickets. And we will see you there March 8th through 10th. That's how I'm feeling right now. Me too. Me too. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's coming up. <laughs> so this episode, this episode, hey, I'm wearing the right shirt for it. Am I right? You mentioned Romulan Ale. Yeah. Yeah happy about that where where did we drink romulan ale it's got to be at one of these parties one of these like uh star trek date parties i think yeah i don't yeah. know i i know that at the way back in the day at uh the star trek experience they had you know romulan ale uh i believe at the rio when we go to star trek las vegas or stlv uh they have some Romulan ale stuff. You and I got some Romulan ale sent to us from trekwines.com, our good buddies over at yeah. Trek Wines. That beautiful Romulan ale you and I got. Um, which I somewhere. which I devoured. <laughs> yeah. That thing yeah, devoured me. Right. <laughs> it was How gone. was it? It's pretty good, good right? Stuff. Pretty good. Pretty good. But obviously not as good as the real thing, because this Romulan was complaining about the the way the Romulan ale tastes. <laughs> yeah, the synthahol. He's like, don't give me synthahol. none of that synthahol. Uh, but, oh, actually, you know what? Yeah, the, the Star Trek experience used to sell Romulan ale in a six-pack, like a six-pack of beer. And yeah. I still have... I don't think the actual beverage, but I still have like the container that the six pack, you know, carrying case it said like Romulan yeah. ale with their big thing. You know, it's illegal in all states. <laughs> uh, don't Romulan ale and drive. That's what you can't. Yeah, do. ain't that the truth. So what did you think of this particular episode, by the way? Because I do remember it a little bit, but I wasn't 100% sure where the twists and turns take us and i love that season three is finally giving us twists and turns that we don't necessarily see coming because sirak yeah did you see it coming that the romulans this was all a trick that the romulans were playing to out this admiral <clears throat> no i didn't um what especially with a little you know, when that admiral pulls up that little thing from his boot, it makes you think, what is that device? Is it a listening device? Is it an explosive? Uh, you didn't know that it was at the time this philod yeah. philodestine chip or whatever it was. It's like a they death tums. That. Yeah. 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 A death tums, a cyanide pill. <laughs> but um, so, yeah, that was good. That was good because I didn't know. And I'm watching it thinking, oh, this guy's up to something nefarious. He's, you know, but turns out he was being misled himself, but he was honest. He was being truthful about what he thought, except what he thought was a lie. So he was being truthful about a lie. And that's how complex, you know, 
that particular situation was. I thought that made it for good for good writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. Uh, I remembered. I was like, okay, so the the question is, do we believe him or do we not believe him? And I seem to remember thinking, okay, this is. I remember that we do believe him. He's not lying. He's being honest to the best of his ability. Even when Troy says you're hiding something, it's because he was hiding his true identity, if I remember correctly. Um, but I had yeah. forgotten that just how tragic this is. That he, you know, he already knew what he was getting into with regards to sacrificing his career, sacrificing his relationship with his family and everything. Mm -hmm. And he could never go home. He could never, but, but to know that he did all that for nothing. And he's got to feel like the ultimate sucker. That's got to be horribly painful. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know that it's for nothing. I don't know that it's for nothing. But it's not for what he wanted and what he expected and what he thought. But for nothing is not really the case because certain things have, you know, this butterfly effect, this domino ripple effect on whatever happens in life. And so that encounter that was incurred with uh, Commander Tomalak at the end and the repercussions that reverberate from that. I don't know what's going to happen later on in the show. I don't know how that's going to be recalled later on, but it seems like it would be a setup for further explorative relationship with the Romulans, further either heightening or lowering of tensions between the Romulans. So there are certain things that may reverberate from this particular episode. Um, the thing that I was a little bit upset with was the fact that if you're going to make this decision to do that, he, the, the self-destruction of the Romulan warbird that he was on, mm -hmm. where they could have kind of extrapolated technology from that. And that would have been, at least he would have done it for that, right? He would have said, well, at least. I've moved the needle forward and my enemies are weakened because of my defection. That would have made a little bit more of some kind of, you know, reason behind it that justified his actions for his sake. But I still think that everything has repercussions. And, and later on down the line, which is what they alluded to with the whole letter, you know, that mm -hmm. he was, that he left behind that one day, the relations will get to the point where we can deliver this to his family and they can read his letter. So that is along the same line of my thinking of there are ripple effects. There is a long-term butterfly effect to these incidences that occurred in this episode. So you can't say for nothing is what I mean. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. You know, I completely agree with that. That's a really good point because on top of that, it also showed the Federation that, hey, they're not all enemies. Within your enemy, there is a diversity of opinions. There are people that can be touched. They all love their families the same way we love our families. And that there is hope, basically, that some of them you can trust, which we learned just a couple episodes ago in The Enemy. If you remember, uh, our good buddy Steve Rankin joined us for the enemy who by the way if you remember that character that romulan that was dying on the on the bed mm -hmm. uh who didn't want Worf's blood to infest him his name was patak which is hilarious because that's also the same word for a klingon insult which was funny because right after in sickbay as i mentioned earlier in in sickbay in today's episode uh they're talking about that Romulan named Patak, and then yeah. the Romulan calls Worf the Klingon insult Patak. Obviously, it's spelled differently. It's like P E T A Q or something instead of P E P A T A H K or something like that. But anyway, I just thought that was really funny. I'm like, do they realize they just called Worf Patak right after they were done talking about Patak? <laughs> that was funny. But anyway, so 
it's good to know that, you know, for the Federation to keep that in mind that like, look, not all of them are bad. They just have a different perspective and that some of them can be reached and some of them might be looking to not go to war. They're maybe not all warmongers. They maybe care about their families and they want to take out, take care of their families and they want to prevent wars. And so there, that's, that's a good point that it wasn't for nothing in his mind. It's all for nothing. But us watching the show, we realize uh, what was done. And in that one scene that he says, before he tells us about his family, he says to Picard, did you ever marry or have children or something? Picard was like, no. And then when he says, uh, I, I don't remember what he says, but he says something to Picard about like, oh, well, you should have or something like that. And then Picard's like, yes, yes, it's all very interesting. But like he's like, yeah. what, what is yeah. this lecture about? And he's like, no, no, no. Yeah. Let me get to my point. I thought that was terrific. I I did like that too. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's very interesting. Whatever. I don't want to talk about that, really. Yeah. My personal life and the decisions I've made. I don't need to get into that. Uh, oh, there it, it is. Very good. Anyway, go on. Sorry. No, it was good. I, I, I wrote that down too in my notes as far as a moment that played very well. Um, they're doing other things to cater to Patrick Stewart. I think the, the, the man um, in this particular episode, um, specifically with the, the opening, you know, Shakespeare and King Henry and, and that whole uh, opening montage sequence, I believe is something that, is inserted to appeal to Patrick Stewart's appetite for Shakespeare, for his love of Shakespeare. And, and actually, Brent did a very good job, I thought, in, in that particular um, performance as well. Mm -hmm. What I liked about his Shakespeare was the way he did not alter his voice to too much. When I see Shakespeare, it's always with this grandiose um verbose kind of um tone to the person to the performer it's always and for art thou death and it's very big and grand and brent did it in a different way that i haven't seen really done too often and that was this very casual um casual conversation very different tone that he took in the in the language of his Shakespeare performance. And I thought, wow, it sounded very of the time because I doubt people of those times were speaking in that kind of way. Right. I dare thou to be thy, you know, they were probably talking how we talk right now. Just those were the words, right? Yeah. And so I thought Brent did a very good job of making that point come across too in his portrayal of it. You know, taking that uh, that scene a bit more too, there's something that was kind of baffling to me, which is, are we supposed to pretend that we couldn't tell that one of the characters was played by Patrick Stewart? <laughs> yeah. I, I thought the same thing. I wrote two Patrick Stewarts in the same scene. But I'm, <laughs> but are are we really supposed to pretend like? I, I just thought that Pat that. Picard was going to stop being that character and say, very good. Yeah. Of it. But then when it showed him watching, I'm like, okay, so now, and then, and then you come to realize, okay, so that's just to, that's just to further your point where they're really trying to placate him or to really yes. appeal to his love of Shakespeare by saying, yeah. okay, we'll do a Shakespeare scene. And if you're really good, if you're really nice, we'll let you play one of the characters. We'll, muddy you up a little bit nobody will even know or and if they do know they'll be like wow i'm so impressed by your acting skill and he's like oh yeah. that does sound very nice i do have quite the acting <laughs> skill you know yes. <laughs> like are we supposed to pretend yes. like we don't it was just weird because i'm like yeah. that's obviously yes. patrick stewart and it. he's doing a great job but just let it be yeah. picard playing that character that's i okay. thought the exact same thing that's why i said they're playing to they're playing to Patrick Stewart. They, they're basically saying, hey, how can we um, re-invitalize your interest? He may have went into there and say, I'm, you know, this is, I can't do this show anymore. It's too boring. And we're talking about science shit. And I like more Shakespeare, more Shakespeare. 
and it seems like they just threw in this extra Shakespeare part. What if they're like, we'll do a an, an, uh, Shakespeare episode. He's like, oh, okay, Shakespeare episode. And then when he gets the script, he's like, it's a Shakespeare scene, bro. Whoops. I guess it got edited. <laughs> <laughs> Rough draft. Uh, and, then, and, and then he plays this it. like hunchback of Notre Dame type, and he changes his accent too. I don't know if you noticed, yeah. but his accent it was a more of an Irish accent, if I thought, if I'm not mistaken. It was something thicker. I was thinking, you know, maybe I was thinking maybe Scottish, but it wasn't quite Scottish. I'm not sure if it was Irish or it might have just been like deeper. England, you know, like way up in the depths of Blackpool, <laughs> England, behind every tree trunk and next to the swamp. <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was a different accent than I'm used to hearing from him. So it was different in that way. The performance, the guy seemed a little he seemed like he was hunching over to a degree. They made him look like a caveman. And <laughs> And I thought to myself the exact same thing. How is he in the scene? I, I, at least make a reference to it. Like, um, your soldier there looks a lot like, looks very familiar, Dana. <laughs> something, <laughs> something to that. Yeah. Guard goes, that's an attractive young man right there. <laughs> a little dirty, <laughs> but charming. <laughs> he needs yeah. polishing, but he's a great fine lad. <laughs> Yeah, so that yeah, was I, uh, I, I that was weird. It was a little weird. Like you said, are they expecting us to notice or not notice? Do they do they right. think they pulled off the makeup job and we just had no idea? And his accent just really threw us <laughs> where we're like, "What? That was Picard? No way." He's like, "Yes, it was. Twas I." We're like, "Wow, how did you do it?" <laughs> uh, <laughs> And he's watching himself so amused, which is another kind of, you know, it's like he was so pleased with himself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Very it was well, just, Good job. Good job. It was just I, a little I, weird. I, I didn't know it was a if we weird. were supposed to recognize him or not. I, I just, I assumed that was going to be Picard himself and then saying computer freeze program and then wiping the makeup off his face. You know, just like he was doing the program with data so i i don't know why they didn't do it that way but i'm sure they had their reasons and it works fine and, and i'm sure the reason is yeah is that patrick stewart wanted to play the role and they're like okay sounds fun and he loved it and he's like oh this and he was pro i can't imagine him on set that day <laughs> he was probably teaching everybody about you know shakespeare lovers we know shakespeare lovers they love to tell you so i bet you yeah. in between the scenes he would say you know, in this scene, oh, this is a great scene because you know <laughs> later on in the and the grip's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm just, I, I, I just want to plug that thing in real quick. Can you? Oh well, <laughs> yeah. you know, in the second scene, and oh, well, God, you okay. play Mortimer, and Mortimer goes on to kill the like. <laughs> he knows how right. to plug. <laughs> yes, <laughs> like, like all right, it's just. <laughs> Let's get a, let's get this over with. But I bet it was a good day for him, so I'm happy for him. Uh, yeah, he, you know, and they used it to set up the theme, which they exited the scene with, which is the whole idea of the king being amongst the soldiers and feeling, you know, that he's in the fight with them. They recycled that line later on in the episode where he says. Uh, if the cause is just and honorable, they are prepared to give their lives. And that was essentially the theme that was extracted from that scene, which is the soldiers talking about the, the just cause of the king and, 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 and whether that would make their fight an honorable one or would reverberate in the king having to pay, you know, suffer consequences. So it's, you know, if we have a leader that is, that is just and righteous, then people will follow him, fight for him and give their lives for him. But if they find that he's doing some, if he's leading them in an unjust way, then, then he will have, have to pay with his own head. So I think that was the main extrapolation of that Shakespeare story, which they, recycled later on and i really like the way patrick performed that moment in that when he was saying my crew is willing to die for whatever it takes and there was there was a level of yeah there was a level of bravado there that i thought was appropriate 
You know, like you're not going to scare me with the threat of 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 killing us because we're we're here already signing up for that uh, threat. You know, we already know that that's a possibility, and that's why we go and wear this uniform and you know take the the necessary action that we take. But yeah, yeah, it was it was it was a lot of placation for um, Picard. You know, uh, bravado is a good word for it. Uh, there was a couple moment. There were a couple moments. You know, the the right amount. You know, we like it when Cisco does it. We like it when Picard does it. We like it when Janeway or Kirk is walking bravado. But every once in a while, the moment calls for it. Um, like yeah. toward the end, when he says, "Oh, um, Tomalock says something to the effect of." Uh, you know, and w- whatever it was, uh, he says, you know, I, I expected more from you than an idle threat. And Picard says, with a smirk, then you shall have it. I'm like, ooh, Picard, you little rascal. You, you know, yeah. he's he's kind of feeling himself. And then the the Klingon war birds, uh, or birds of prey, I should say, uh, decloak. And so that, you know, there was a little bit of that bravado there you know every once in a while we get something like that and we remember a few episodes ago when the bad guys were hailing picard and he takes his time and he walks over and he like dusts off the little the little uh thing Mm -hmm. on the wall you know wipes it off and checks things around and you know those are nice nice moments they're very nice moments and and the other thing that i want to highlight in this episode was Ronald Moore's writing. There's certain things that he does that um, resonate with me. One of them is making recalls to previous episodes. Yeah. I like to have a moment there that recalls something that happened. Like it's like if we were to talk right now about, oh, you remember that time when uh, when Michael Westmore was, you know, given the lifetime achievement award. We're we're talking about something that happened and we're recalling it in the normal flow of a conversation. It's something that happens all the time. Um, and so when he does it in his writing, it makes perfect sense. Like there was that moment where Dr. Crusher looks over at Worf and she says, I, I have experience with this, right? Kind of a moment there with Worf. Calling us back to the enemy episode, but just just between me and you, like there was that moment between us, like, you know, you remember that conversation we had. Oh, you mean, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. I can okay. Hear you. Cool. Yeah. Uh, she used the word recently, uh, letting us know I am referencing that episode you just saw three weeks ago. Uh, yes. Or if you missed it, sorry, Star Trek fans, because back then in 1989 is like, well, nuts yeah. to you. Sorry. In 20 years, there'll be something that's good comes writing. Out called Netflix. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's still good writing on Ronald Moore's part. Too. Absolutely. I love it recall that you know uh, those are great re- the other part that i really love was ron moore bringing back the uh tomalock line when he says now it is you that have crossed the neutral zone this time remember it was the other way around before very good yeah and it was just that's so good that's just good writing that's for me uh, you know i'm thinking oh okay this guy knows he he's watched the episodes too you know <laughs> You know, that he's on top of it. He's on top of the, the catalog of the history that they're creating for themselves. And I think it's just smart. It's smart writing for me. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we love it as fans, too. We like to see uh, the show being referenced. Because, look, we understand that most of it's bottle episode after bottle episode after bottle episode. But we want to believe that it's all connected. It's all the same world. That this isn't the Twilight Zone where it's just kind of like, drops it right in we wanted to believe that this is all the same world you know if if two people Continuity. start making out last episode we want to at least know that there's something going on in this episode or you know we don't want to just or if Pulaski dies in one episode we don't want to just see her alive again in the next one you know like we <laughs> have to have something to make it yeah. feel real and things like that do let's take a quick yeah. break and talk a bit more about this uh because there's a lot more to talk about i really like this episode 
We'll be right back on the seventh rule. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the seventh rule with Ciroc Lofton. Hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk. Here are the trivioids of the week. We got a few of them. Data practices some Shakespeare. There's a Romulan scout ship deep within the neutral zone. A Romulan warbird is obviously piloted by stormtroopers. Remember because it kept missing its target? That was weird. <laughs> In two days, a fleet of Romulan warbirds will be within striking distance of 15 Federation sectors. In their long history of war, the Romulans have rarely attacked first. They prefer to test their enemies' resolve. Resolve. Setal calls Worf a Patak right after discussing the Romulan named Patak. Riker calls Admiral Jarek a Verul, which I guess is some <laughs> bad word. Admiral Jarek likes his water at 12 Ankians. The Federation Council has convened an emergency session. Picard wants Data's clarity of thought and objectivity. Admiral Jarek was Setal's superior officer, supposedly. There's a Klingon vessel named Bordis and Geordi teaches data about guts yeah bordis <laughs> by the way bordis is a character in the orville one of the main characters of the orville uh he's like a science officer is he science officer i think he's science officer he's in blue um one of the main characters uh second officer and his name is bordis and i'm wondering i'm like huh well the orville is kind of like in its own way, a love letter to Star Trek. I wonder if, I would think that's probably an accident, but maybe it's not. Maybe they just said, oh, Klingon ship Bordis. Let's call this character Bordis. Don't know. Or it could be it could be a hat tip to the UK Prime Minister, Bordis Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, uh, I think, insert bad joke here. That's what yeah, I saw. Yeah, I think that joke <laughs> Bordis to tears. <laughs> there we go there we go we're warming up everybody we're we're warming back up here we go <laughs> yeah uh okay so apogee by the way they mentioned the, the word apogee that's a word Where i didn't know um that when data was talking nerd talk about like oh you know signal boost or carrier wave or something like that you know he was showing this graph he oh, says yeah. it will it will reach its apogee and i'm like apogee i worked for a company called apogee when we did a show called man at arms with uh danny trejo and we were testing out all these weapons and stuff like old old weapons from like hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago from around the world <clears throat> and we would test them out, field test them and stuff, you know, ballista missiles and all kinds of stuff. Really, really, really a ton of fun. But anyway, the company was called Apogee. So I'm like, okay, well, what the heck does Apogee mean? Uh, the highest point in the development of something, a climax or culmination. Okay, that fits what Data said. Nothing more to that. I was just, I was like, I guess I should have looked yeah. that up a while ago. <laughs> That's what it means. <laughs> Yeah, I, that's what I kind of thought it meant. Um, I thought it was referring to like the highest point of the curve mm -hmm. on on the you know, yeah, whatever, like it, like the an apex, the trajectory. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, but you know, there was other things that I liked too. I liked the fact that we saw a functionality of Starfleet in this episode, where you have the admiral sending a private communication which was transferred to the ready room, that private communication were laying mm. high level Starfleet conversation, private, you know, where you need to, where you get to see the inner workings of how Starfleet thinks and how they Intel gather. Um, the, the advice about going to Nor, Norcan, uh, uh, no, was it Nelvana the, the, three? Yeah. You know, Nelvana three. That one was of my one favorite of bands back in the day. Yes, R.I.P. Kurt Cobain. Yeah, I wrote the thing. At first, I heard Nirvana too. Um, but yes, the idea that came originated in the transmission between uh, the Admiral and uh, Picard. That was some kind of intelligence that they had. Hey, why don't you head over there to this particular region? And the also the uh, the other thing that was given was the idea not to trust this 
this guy. Like, oh, he is Admiral Al Al Dajar Jarak, and don't trust him. Uh, you know, Starfleet. Our intelligence says that he's not telling the truth. So those are the kinds of insight in, in the communication and intelligence gathering to me that you know that we see um, Starfleet doing, and that private communication gives us a small glimpse of of that the kind of military industrial functionality. You know what I mean? Yeah, I like it. You know, it's kind of like uh, you know how the sausage is made kind of stuff. Every once in a while, we want to know yeah. a little bit more about. Starfleet, a little bit more about the Federation, a little bit more about the politics yeah, uh, of it and the structure of it. Section 31 does that for us, too. Right. When they started to introduce that kind of, you know, idea in Deep Space Nine, I thought that backstory also gave us an insight into high level, you know, Starfleet intelligence and what kind of thought processes they were going through as well. I also thought it was funny that... Uh, who was it? Data, I think, called uh, General Custer Riker's countryman. Was it Data? It was someone called him his countryman. I'm like, oh, I guess, I guess that's how they would view it. Or was it the the Romulan? I don't remember. But I just, it was weird to call him your yeah, countryman. It was a I'm reference. Like, I'm like, oh, okay. I guess it is our countryman. <laughs> it is a somebody that lived <laughs> in our country at some point. I guess. Okay. It's just kind of it's a little weird thing to hear for me. Um, that that actually gave me a little insight to how much um, both Ira and Ron Moore love these these stories of the Battle of Little Bighorn and the Alamo. They always refer to these kinds of events, and totally. they're obviously, you know, historical kind of junkies for those kinds of facts. So. And whenever they get a chance to insert something about Davy Crockett or, you know, George Custer, they they will throw it in there and because they have an affinity for that particular subject matter. So that just revealed to me another thing that we see consistently with Ron Moore and Ira Bear as well. But, because, you know, in this particular place, Ron Moore, which is his fascination for these kinds of historical record. Yeah, um, I want to point out. Uh, a moment that I really liked. There are a few moments I really liked, even if they were kind. Of, you could kind of see them coming. You know, when Picard is talking to that the admiral guy, um, he says, "What's the admiral guy's name?" I always forget his name. Jerok. I remember C Tall, but then we find out his real name is Jerok. Um, he says you something to the effect of, "You know, Picard says like, oh, she'll." She'll, your daughter will grow up thinking you're a traitor or knowing you're a traitor or something. He says, yes, she will grow up to hate me or something like that. He says, oh, he says she will grow up believing her father is a traitor, but she will grow up. And, you know, it really just shows where his mind is. He's like, this isn't about me anymore. I just don't want, you know, my family to die in a needless war. Um, mm -hmm. Another moment when he says, uh, Picard says, right before that, he says, when because the guy's trying to play both sides. He wants to give the Federation enough information to stop the Romulans, but he doesn't want to give them too much information. He doesn't want to betray his race. He doesn't want to betray them. He just wants to give a tiny bit of a little, you know, Mm -hmm. And Picard says, you've crossed over, Admiral. You've made yourself comfortable with that. Or you make yourself comfortable with that. As in, like, it's too late. You've already betrayed your people. You might as well S or get off the pot. And, you know, this is when he's convincing him to, like, you either give us all the information mm -hmm. or this doesn't work. And we can't trust you. That was the other thing. It's like, we're not going to go to this base unless you give us all the information and you can prove to us that we can trust you. We, you know, actually, Troy could have been more useful in there because then at that moment, she could go, now he's telling the truth, Captain. <laughs> yes, thank you, Troy. Yes, that's all very well good. <laughs> no, but... Yeah. Uh, he, he did use Troy and Riker, and I thought that was a good scene as well, the interrogation scene with Troy and Riker 
I did like the idea that the two of them were the interrogators, you know. Um, um, and the scene was enjoyable for me. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I, I do get what you're saying about um, the kind of the, the back and forth between Picard and, and uh, Jarrock. G- yeah. Um, but I, I wanted to bring up some other scenes too. There was a moment there where Data kind of gets a joke about, you know, he's trying to reach out to the guy. He sees Admiral sitting there and he says, you know, he tries to reach out to him. And he obviously doesn't want to be bothered with data. And he says something to the effect of, of, you know, I have, I know some Romulan cybernetics yeah. that would love to get this close to you. And data says, you know, I don't think that's a good thing. <laughs> like, I don't yeah. feel like uh, I like getting good vibes on that, you know? Yeah. It was actually I a like, really funny line. What did he say? Uh, yes. He says, I, I don't find that partic- that concept to be particularly appealing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It yes. Was. That reminds me of another uh, when is it? I think it's when Data is talking with Lore in a in a further episode. And Data Data says, somehow I question your sincerity. That's him saying my BS meter is blasting right now. You know? <laughs> but then when, yes. so when he said, you know, he's just got a really interesting way of, of saying that. But when he says, I don't find that concept to be particularly appealing. That's him saying, I'll pass. Thanks very much. Yeah, that, that's, that's a hard that's... pass for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, did like also the scene between Jordy and Data where they were talking about using your instinct and kind of, you know, using your gut to kind of piece together the bridges between the facts and what you don't have and what you do and feeling your way out with intuition and instinct. I thought that was a great lesson that almost anybody can benefit from who doesn't understand that concept um, about feeling your way out with intuition and, and taking the facts that you have and finding kind of extrapolations from it or connecting of dots from one dot to the other. It's a very practical way to think critically. Yeah. Did you, I wasn't sure. Did you agree with what they said about what, what the conclusion was about? Yeah. You get the facts, the the things that you do know for sure. And then it's up to the person's personality to go with their gut like for example if you have fact a b and c and your personality is to not be very trustworthy then you're going to fill in the blanks and you're going to say my gut instinct says we can't trust them but if you're more of a you know glass half full person or you're trusting or whatever like that then maybe your gut instinct is "Mm, i don't know i think we could trust them so what that tells us is that the writer, Ronald D. Moore, is telling us that the gut instinct doesn't make you right or wrong. It's just based on your personality type and who you are and your experience. And so sometimes your gut instinct leads you astray because it that's just your personality type. And sometimes it happens to hit because it matches your personality. What did you think of that? Yeah, I mean, that's essentially what the episode is about. Um, because Admiral Girac is is using his personality and his gut to assume that he wasn't being fed a bunch of lies and disinformation, which was a great also word that was used in this episode. And ever it's it's a common word right. today now because oh, yeah. everybody's talking about <laughs> misinformation and disinformation. But in yeah. 1990, you know. Prior to COVID and politics, this word wasn't really being circulated that heavily. So, but I do think it's consistent with the story. Yes, that's the story. The story is this admiral using his gut instinct, base piecing facts that he has, taking his personality to account, and saying these are the circumstances. He happened to be wrong, but because the facts were wrong and purposely um mis- misguided so so i do think that um 
And then somebody with a different personality who doesn't have the courage to go against the Romulan Empire and defect and, and leave behind their family, they would interpret those same facts and say, well, let me just keep my mouth shut and not do anything about it. And, and, and their personality would, would play out to have less consequences than we saw in this particular episode. Yeah, you know, I think there's a third one, too. I think there's misinformation, disinformation, and now I think there's also malinformation. And I'm just like waiting for anti-information, uninformation, <laughs> non-information, A-information. Uh, I'm trying to think yeah. of more things that mean, you know, anti <laughs> or non or un or... Anyway, um, but yeah, so... But what that tells us is that their guts their gut instinct was right that they could trust him uh, because he was not trying to deceive. And so they, yeah, so that's an important distinction that you're making. They made the right decision to trust him. He was giving them the facts as he knew them, but he had been fed incorrect facts. And so, you know, they, they were right, but they were wrong in a way. Now they now would be really impressive though if they go, hmm, I think we can trust him, but I think he's wrong. Now that's 3D chess. If they're that good, maybe yeah. But how can you? I don't see how you'd be able uh, to you'd have to get more information about how he attained that information, his history um, right. with the Romulan Empire, what you know, whether he was a trusted person to get that kind of information. That that would have a lot more intelligence gathering than what they provided for us in this particular episode. But, um, but yeah, I, I definitely think that it proved to be the case. I, I wanted to ask you the Klingons that came at the end, cause I, I don't remember them calling for backup. Is it, that, that, that's the scene. I didn't miss that. Right. <laughs> These, they just showed up. I, you may have missed it, but if you did, so did I, uh, I don't remember okay. that either. Uh, okay. Suddenly they were there, and I don't remember if they mentioned them. If they did, it was a very passing comment to where I should have been paying better attention, but I don't think so. I think it was just like, hey, there are Klingon ships that are in the area. Federation ships are far away, so let's call the only people we can call. And it was right. really smart. It's a nice twist. It gives Picard you know, his, his, his blustery line, and then Tomalak says, you will not survive. And Picard says, neither will you. Ha, ha, ha. And we're like, ooh, <laughs> Picard got him. You know, now we're going to come back yeah. next time on Admiral Tomalock versus Captain Picard. <laughs> they have a good um, beef between each other that's really good. I like the. It's an intelligent, sophisticated kind of chess move of a yeah. beef between each other. I, I like it same. better. I like it a lot. Um, particularly when... Uh, Picard's like, oh, very well then, and he pulls his thing down. He's like, I'm, I'm ready to get, I'm ready to get out of here. He's like, you know, sits back in the chair, and Tom Locke says, without even an apology, you know, like, you didn't, you're not going to even apologize, you know. And he says, if that's what it takes, Picard, you know, if that's what it requires, then, then you I have offer one for it. Me. Yeah, yeah, or something like that. But and he, he says, no, it does. It. And he says, no, it doesn't. And he's like, so you can yeah. hold the apology. I'm like, but I feel like he kind of halfway did apologize in that line. <laughs> But not quite, and then this guy's yes. pulled the apology. It's I, I love it too. I was thinking the same thing. I was like, I want to see more of these two. Like I'm these glad two. that Tomalock doesn't die or you know get disbarred from you know Romulan town. Like I yeah. want to see these guys keep meeting up with each other and become real enemies and and rivals and foes. Yeah. You know. Yeah, he he could very well be the golden god of this show if they totally. if they write it that way. Hundred um, percent, because he's such a good he he has the zingers back for Picard because Picard always has this bravado with him and he counters very well with his with his language like no no that's all right I don't need your apology we're just going to destroy you and you're going to become uh, prisoners of war uh, just the, the way they come back at each other it's a real tit for tat thing and I I like him. Uh, this Commander Tomalock, I like his performances. He's very good at playing the villain. Me too. Uh, and I remember always liking him and 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 that. However, I was surprised to find out he's only in four episodes because I remember him 
being very present in the next generation. But sometimes if, you know, there's a good enough, meaty enough story, it feels like somebody is more present than they actually are. Like uh, Shakar in Deep Space Nine was in three <laughs> episodes. And we're like, how is that possible? It feels like he was like in a dozen, but he was in three episodes. At least episodes. 10. Yeah, well, this guy's in four. But check this out, everybody. I think it's just about time for Carrie Schwentz home run of the episode oh wow what do you think who gets the home run of today's episode home run of the episode uh, ba, ba, ba. Uh, i'm gonna give it to the guest star uh the man who plays admiral Girard. I think he came on. He did a very good job of being mysterious enough. Uh, he was suspicious enough where I couldn't tell if I believed him or not either. And he was he played that suspicion. He didn't really foreshadow any of anything with his performance. I thought he was just mysterious enough, just eerie enough, just adversarial enough when it when it came to um, war. I liked the way he interacted with Riker when you know he said, "I like that guy." That Klingon do whatever it is you know and he, he flips over on there and he he is a good adversary for Riker and Troy when they're trying to interrogate him he's like I'm not breaking you know you just want the ship you you just think this he, he gave he, he gave he carried the episode with his performance in a lot of ways um so yeah I'm gonna give it to Admiral Girac, and I, I should say the actor's name, but I don't. I didn't write his name down. What? What is? It is James Sloyan. And uh, first of all, I agree with you, James Sloyan, uh, because, like you said, at first he starts off mysterious, but then we get a little bit of earnestness from him when he starts talking about his family. You know, when he starts saying all that for nothing. You know, we're actually feeling it for him. Also. Uh, <clears throat> we do see him again in the next generation, not that character, but the actor in season seven, he plays Kamatar in Firstborn. So that's way down the line. We'll see him in a couple years, but he also was in Star Trek Deep Space Nine in two episodes. He is the actor that plays Odo's dad, Dr. Mora. Remember the guy that has the scientist that has his hair yeah. slicked back that Odo bases his likeness off yeah. of? It's Dr. Mora. He plays Dr. Mora in those two episodes. And he's also in one episode of Star Trek Voyager. So this is a guy. So that means he played four characters in five episodes of three series. So big shout out to him. And yeah, I thought he did a great job here worked perfectly for the story everything that they tried to accomplish i thought that he did what they were going for and he did it just fine i thought the writing was great and i thought that he was great yeah. speaking of great people boy oh boy we've got a list of great people right here and their <laughs> names are homer frizzell dr Anne marie siegel eve england out in wales yvette blackman tom tj jackson bay out in missouri Titus mm -hmm. Moeller, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Tierney C. Diekman, Anil O. Palat, Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, Dr. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Fultz, My Life from Tokyo, The Matt Boardman, Chris McGee, Justin Weir, Jake Barrett, Henry Unger, Allison Leach Hyde, Julie Manisfi, Marsha Classic Schreier, Greg K. Wickstrom enjoying the sun out in Hawaii because he lives there. Jed Thompson, Dr. Susan V. Gruner, Glenn Iverson, Dave Gregory, Tim Baum, a.k.a. Grandpa One, and of course, Jason Oaken. All right, everybody, we got the free for all up next. Everybody's chanting for it. free for all, free for all. Here it comes. We'll be right <laughs> back on the seventh rule. <laughs> Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Seventh Rule with Ciroc Lofton. This is Hello. The Free For All with Melissa Longo. Hello. <laughs> and, of course, Jason M. Oaken. We've got the Dark Lord, Chris McGee. Hey, hey. 
Mm. Allison Leach Hyde, fellow Pisces, fellow to Chris, that is. Uh, we got Grandpa One, aka Tim Baum. And he's wearing a Navy shirt, by the way. And Anil Opalat. Hello. Where are you, by the way, right now, Anil? I'm in Sofia, Bulgaria. Wow. Sofia? Isn't that oh, the wow. capital? That's cool. Yeah. Amazing. Wow. Very cool. It's a Bulgaria. <laughs> Great art pictures. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, Let's see. Oh, Jake Cisco guesses the IMDb score. Uh, IMDb score. I'm going to go with a 7.2. 7.2. Mm-hmm. Does anybody else have any guesses that doesn't already know? Probably go higher, maybe 7.8, seven, 7.9. Seven, yeah, I don't know, so I'd it was definitely in the sevens, maybe eight. Oh, wow. I was thinking 6.7, something lower, but. Ooh. And Neil's pissed. Anybody <laughs> else? <laughs> He's been mad all day. <laughs> uh, Chris or Allison, you guys have any guesses or you already know? <laughs> all right. Uh, it is an 8.4. Oh. 8.4, everybody. Okay. Well it's deserved. Good I knew it. I knew it. Uh, you guys catch any non-appearance mentions today? I didn't. I caught one some sort of. Uh, there was a, uh, Riker says, it's a cloaking device of some sort to hide the base. You got that right, got Chris? Good. Mm-hmm. Yep. Although, would, because... Dr. Crusher alluded to the Romulan that she had worked on before in a previous episode with the at count. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, good point. His name was Patak. <laughs> it was. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, we were talking about him for like 10 minutes. And we didn't even <laughs> notice that. That's a, uh, yeah, it's good stuff. All right. Uh, okay. Melissa Longo, will you please get us started off on the right track? Mm -hmm. Um, well, first, I would like to say, I love Ronald D. Moore. (laughs) I think he's a fantastic writer, and I am a fan of his work. Um, this episode left me heartbroken, (laughs) to be frank. I mean, yeah, I, I think James Sloyan... I've been trying to practice how to say his last name. Sloyan, I think he did a fantastic job as Admiral Jarok, um, who, fun fact, would go on to play Odo's dad, Dr. Mora, um, in Deep Space Nine. So awesome. But uh, I liked his scenes between um, him and, and Picard. And um, yeah, but the overall sense that I got at the end of the episode was just such heaviness because he had the courage to hope for peace and so that his daughter could have a brighter future. And then the Romulans go and prove that they are just treacherous assholes. Um, (laughs) And and, uh, to me, they seem like bigger villains than most other Star Trek species out there because you never can trust what they say. Mm -hmm. You can never trust where their intentions are. And spies everywhere, all the time. So, you know, I, I don't know. And then his death was heartbreaking too because he gave up everything for this lie. Um... Yeah, so that was sad. It was cool to see Patrick Stewart playing Michael Williams from Henry V. That was really <laughs> fun in the opening scene <laughs> with all of that makeup on. Um, that was fun. And um, Carrie Schwent, who is currently on board a Star Trek cruise, asked me to read her limerick for her. So I will um, acquiesce to her request. 
Uh, this was her intro for it. This is what Jarok was thinking before he killed himself. So here's the limit or limerick. I don't regret why I chose to leave home, though I know it means I must stand alone. It's the right thing to do. I must see it through. What happens now is yet to be known. Excellent work. Thank you very much. Melissa Longo out in the LA area. Uh, Jason mm -hmm. M. Oaken. I don't think we know where you are. Somewhere on the East Coast for sure. What do you think of this particular episode? Well, it's uh, it, it's certainly the one that I've enjoyed, uh, you know, for, for many many years. It, it, it's something I I can go back to and watch, you know, over and over again. It's uh, it's one of those uh, uh, wonderful episodes of the third season that stands up. Uh, that is uh, at some level, as Melissa said, a signature of uh, of, Ron, uh, of Ron Moore. I know he tried to downplay his somewhat downplay his role in writing of the episode and the fact that maybe some of the acts were split up. And uh, just like, I guess, to some degree, yesterday's Enterprise, for whatever reason, uh, it just came together really well. I think the dialogue jumps off the page as you listen to it, as you read it. I mean, certainly having uh, uh, Shakespeare and a teaser made it maybe a little bit easier to write. Uh, mm -hmm. The fact that you actually just you know, reproduce Shakespeare and you know, seeing that was was actually wonderful. It's 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 one it's it's a first sort of foray into uh, data acting, you know, sort of a dude playing a dude, playing another dude uh, <laughs> on next gen. So it was interesting to see and, you know, think whatever, whatever you want of sort of, you know, uh, letting uh, Patrick Stewart do Shakespeare. And it's always wonderful to see that even, you know, certainly the accent he picked is is an interesting one. Um, you know, unless you know what, uh, what what the actual dialogue is, it's, it's very hard to understand it. But it's, uh, but it's certainly wonderful. I think it looks... <laughs> great i mean there's nothing spectacular about the way it was shot but it looks just right uh it's acted very very well uh melissa as you said james sloyan is wonderful so is patrick uh in it uh obviously you know J james sloyan will come back and by the time he ends up on voyager he even gets sort of a better credit uh, mm -hmm. uh as well so i guess he raised his stature over time and he's certainly great in, you know in the things he's done it's it's a wonderful hour. There are a lot more things to say. I'll save them for later, but it's uh, again, it's one of the uh, one of those episodes that make the third season what it is. One of the perhaps best next gen and Star Trek seasons. Mm -hmm. Man, where's Eve England when you need her to tell us what that dialect was? Right. Whoa. <laughs> I was trying to figure that. Sorok and I were like, we're we're naming every part of the UK. Try Isle of Wight. Isle of Man. Yeah, Neil might know. Uh, what do you think, Neil? Do you know? I, yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't. Like, like it, it's somewhere in that area. I think, like up in the the one of those, like not one of the common South uh, accents. It's it's South, and maybe Yorkshire, uh, hmm. or Yorkshire, <laughs> Manchester. No, that's North. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't talk Bulgaria. It's the one I'm Nicholas. thinking of that's down there. <laughs> no, Man Man yeah, right. <laughs> Manchester and Liverpool are up north. Yeah. They're not the Midlands or the South. Who am I thinking of? I was thinking of Portsmouth. That's what I'm thinking of. Anyway. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I don't I don't remember what that one sounds like. It's been a while. Uh <laughs> look, Grandpa One, save us. What do you think of this episode? Um I loved it. Um, I still remember watching with my now wife, girlfriend at the time, 35 years ago. And it was very intense. I liken it to Duet that was on Deep Space Nine with the Cardassian who wanted to sacrifice himself to for the sins of the Cardassians. And, um, I uh, a couple issues I had is like, okay number one you know Jonathan Franks was the bad cop I'm like oh no no but you know the admiral knew that maybe coin or counterintelligence knew what he was doing and he was willing to sacrifice his family 
to stop a war. And then at the very end, when he realized, I sacrificed my family for nothing. And that's why he took his life. I know we mentioned, you know, it was mentioned earlier that, you know, I want my daughter to grow up. Even if he had been right, his family was gone. They're going to. And. It uh, it really struck me. It's like, you know, are you willing to give up your family to save the future? And then when he realizes he didn't save the future, he was set up. He had no other choice. It's like, I'm done. It's like, I tried. I'm done. I was set up. And, you know, I I think the one bad scene towards the end of the episode when Picard was like still grilling him. And then the very next scene, he was dead. You know, I can understand the whole interrogation with number one, but it's like uh, Picard knew what was going on. He knew he was set up, but he was still, you put us in a bad position, you're going to get us killed. And then, you know, 30 seconds later, everybody's gathered around his quarters where he's dead. But anyway. My two cents. So, <laughs> excellent, good stuff. It's good seeing you again, Grandpa One, aka Tim Baum. Uh, all right, the Dark Lord Chris McGee is here, and thank goodness for that. <clears throat> what did you think of this episode? First time I've ever heard that in reference to me. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a uh, fantastic episode. It's a great intrigue episode that keeps you guessing until the very end as to whether or not Drock was telling the truth or if he was being used as a pawn and so forth. And I greatly appreciate that both ended up being true here. He was telling the truth, but he was being used, um, which just goes to prove, as as Melissa said, how treacherous the, the Romulans are. Um, of course, as has already been mentioned, James Sloyne, I love seeing him and almost everything he does. And, of course, his first appearance here in Star Trek, better known as Dr. Mora on uh, Deep Space Nine. Fantastic there. Um, but little little thing, I I really appreciate the callback in this episode in, in uh, sickbay. The callback to the enemy just a few episodes earlier when Drock mentioned the Galorndon Core incident. One of those uncommon times when TNG would actually make a callback to an earlier episode. Um, the little interrogation room that we see later when they are interrogating him, we, we're going to see that again later on in the show in a fantastic episode, so keep an eye out for that. And I'll end with a memorable quote, because I can't really possibly add more to the, that impact of that final scene than what Grandpa One has already said. It's just he said, said it perfectly. So I'll just go ahead and mention my memorable quote, which is, only of a rule would use such language in public. It's also what they say when somebody says, objection. Overruled. Thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Allison Leach Hyde is up next. What did you think of this one, Allison? I like this episode. I love that the cast gets to play in Shakespeare and plays. I think that's a ton of fun. And the reason we got. Um, Shakespeare, why we got Henry V in this is because they had wanted to do Sherlock Holmes, but they were still in litigation over that. So Stuart went, well, what about Henry V? Because uh, Kenneth Branagh's Henry V had come out relatively recently. And if you haven't seen it, I'll make a plug for that movie. It is beautiful. And every time I watch it, and Branagh is doing the St. Crispin's Day speech, I cry. So always well mm. worth watching. <laughs> and so I also love that Data said that that he picked Olivier and Branagh to, to make his, yeah. his Henry V off of. I've, they're both wonderful movies. Very different, but both wonderful. Yeah. So, Olivier is the best. Yeah. I didn't even make that connection. Good knowledge. Yeah. So love that. Um, fun little behind the scenes with... Um, 
with Patrick in all that makeup, Doug Drexler did that makeup That's on him. That's so cool. Our good pal, Doug Drexler, <laughs> yes. And that was the, Patrick? Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Doug did such a great job. And then the um, actor who was playing the other soldier in that scene um, happens to be, uh, or was at the time, Rosalind Chow's husband. Oh, what? Wow. So, now that's some knowledge. Wow. Yeah. Dive. So just some Amazing. fun little things behind there. And one more little thing that I think is really cool is that originally there was a love story written between Crusher and Druck in this in one of the versions of the script. I Definitely did working. not make it forward, but yeah. it was in there. So. I, could, I could see that working because of yeah. her, the, the fact that she had just done the Romulan thing so they could have the, but it didn't make it, huh? Nope. Did Colm I have a know that, did Colm know that she was <laughs> married or? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. I mean, O'Brien was always quite jealous, but you know. <laughs> That's why he wasn't in this episode. Exactly. <laughs> My favorite line in this one is, um, because you just can't rely on the plain and simple facts, sometimes they lie from Jordy. I love that line. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the guy that plays John Bates, the other Shakespearean actor, was Simon Templeman. And that is the fellow that was married to her uh, Anil O. Palat is here. What's up, Anil? How you been? Good, thanks. Um, what do you think of this one? It's interesting that you you just mentioned the love story that was cut out. I I like this episode a lot. I think the dialogue is incredible. But when, whenever I watch it, there's always something missing about the defector. It, there's something that's really unlikable about him. Like he's very antagonistic, and there's. Unt right until the end, there's nothing where as the audience, you kind of root for him or you you understand his motivation aside from not having a war. So I think if he had a bond with one of the crew, I mean, not necessarily romantic, but if somehow he maybe during the interrogation connected with Riker or Troy or, you know, war favens just on some sort of level that would have kind of that that for me is always the one thing missing and also maybe it's it's meant to be like that because i just whenever i see a romulan i'm like yeah everything you're saying is a lie so yeah <laughs> it's, it's hard to trust them right so yeah um <laughs> totally. so maybe maybe that's it maybe yeah um so yeah but otherwise yeah i think this is a great episode i, I think it's really well written and patrick stewart is absolutely amazing i think he is he, he really just they're just writing, I think, really well for him as the series goes on. Yeah. Ryan, can't you hear you. Yeah. Oh, I was okay. muting myself. <laughs> Jake's final take. What do you got for us? Um, I was going to say that I like the look on Worf's face when the Klingon ships arrived. He kind of had that look <laughs> like, got you. Like, <laughs> yeah. It was a little payback for him and the Robinsons talking all that stuff about him. He finally got his moment to, to one-up them. So I like that they, they focused on that for a second. Um, I also like that we got a <clears throat> officer's log from Data in this episode we don't really get it too much but it was the first time i've heard it and he gave an officer's log because obviously of the conversation picard had with him about recording the events that were taking place i thought it was a good insert there and it made sense contextually with the way the story was flowing um i was a little bit i would have liked more explanation of why um this Admiral Girac uh, didn't want to be in the holodeck with his home environment on Romulan. It, there would a little bit more could have been explained why that he didn't want to be reminded of that place, uh, or because he let it let it go, or some 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 more of a a detachment there to get kind of familiarize ourselves with his personal story and also what, what he's sacrificing in order to, to take this step. 
um, it was it was a little bit of a throwaway for me, you know, like mm. turn the program off. This is my home. This is what I accept now. But I, I would have liked a little bit more meat there. Mm. And um, I don't know how often we see it, but this is the first episode I can remember where uh, one of the main stars of it commits suicide. Right. Um, and it's Point. a sensitive subject dealing with suicide, and they, they they left on that note, not really getting into the, you know, the repercussions and you know the effects of suicide and mental health and and whatnot. It kind of onset really quickly for this character, but it's a serious thing, and um, it's just the first time I see Star Trek actually dealing with it as a subject matter. So. I just wanted to highlight that as well. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's a good point. I don't. We've we've seen characters die, like guest guest uh, actors. You know, their characters die, but yeah, we haven't seen suicides. I don't think. That's yeah, a good and point. I, I I honestly think he would have committed suicide one way or the other. Yeah, because he mm-hmm. knew that, and part of him wanted to go out. Like I saved a war, and then he realized, no, I got my family killed. I didn't do anything. It was all a setup. So he went out thinking he just wasted his life. Yeah. So it's yeah. really sad. But it was still no less of a blow. <laughs> it, no, and yeah. I it was understand. A punch but... in the gut. Shoot. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, I just uh, one of the big things that I, you know, I understand when number one was being the uh, bad cop. But then Picard up until the end was being and he's a smart guy, at least we're told that he knew that this guy really wanted to make a difference. And, yeah, we can't trust him, but we have to support him. And he was very on the bridge yelling at him. And then, you know, 20 seconds later, they're all gathered around his cabin. So anyway. Yeah. I I also wanted to just say about that, that pill that he took that Ronald Moore wrote into the earlier part of the script. That was also a good kind of tool writing wise, because I didn't Mm -hmm. know what that thing was. I, I wasn't sure. That was a, a an explosive device or a recording device, some kind of information gatherer, uh, a virus. It could or have been cyanide. A, yeah, yeah. It could have been anything. And they, when they showed that to us, they gave us the the feeling as the audience, like, oh, he can't be trusted. This guy is has some kind of nefarious motive behind him. We didn't know that that was his like final out option. Like, you know, if shit hits the fan, I'm just going to take this. So I, I think that's a good writing tool for uh, Ron Moore, introducing that to us and showing it to us, questioning what we were seeing, but then it being completely something different later on as a, as, as a twist in the episode. So another compliment to Ron Moore's writing style. Great stuff, everybody. Um... We got a lot more to discuss, but we will in things left unsaid. I got a few things I want to toss your way. Uh, But until then, uh, please, everybody, make sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon for notifications so you don't miss an episode. It's super important. If you're listening in, give us a five star review and a a, sorry, a five star rating and a nice review. We'd really appreciate that. Otherwise, Jason Oaken is going to come for you. Thanks, (laughs) everyone. (laughs) Uh, thank you to Anil, Grandpa One, Allison, Chris, Jason, Melissa, and for myself, Sirach Lofton, Melissa, Aaron Eisenberg. Thank you all very much for hanging out with us, and we'll see you next time. Until then, always remember the seventh rule. <laughs>